Okay, so this is lecture one of object oriented programming. Just uh, spend a minute just going through some of the rules and regs for how the uh, unit's going to be conducted. Um, but basically, uh, it's a new form of programming for a lot of people, and the way that you're going to be assessed is going to be very different as well. So we need to spend a little bit of time talking about that. The lectures aren't going to be delivered in lecture time. In fact, you'll be expected to watch the lecture videos out of lesson. That means that when you come into the lesson, every lesson is going to start with a short test at the start and the bulk of the lesson activity will be based on you comp completing practical exercises based on the lecture materials. Obviously the short test at the start of the lesson is a measurement of how well you've understood the lecture material. What's going to happen is, is that the results of that short test will be an indicator of your level of understanding and then what we'll do is on an individual basis we'll work out whether you need to do any additional work based on the results of that short test. During the course of the semester, there are going to be three exams. There'll be in-class exams. There will also be open book. Now, that means that you'll have access to all the lecture materials, all the PowerPoint slides, uh, on any notes that you've taken, and you can use those materials in order to answer the questions in the test. Once the test is completed, you will have your work marked in front of you and you will know your results straight away. These tests are basically put together again as a milestone test to assess your progress during the unit. The formal assignments uh, that are in this unit uh, incorporate two practical assignments both have programming elements within them and as with any other unit that you've done um, they'll be mapped to your learning outcomes okay so you know as you would expect from a programming unit you'll be doing lots of programming um, so let's just get on with it and let's start with something that everybody should know um, software in general I think I don't think there's anything on that list that you've not had some exposure to but in the eyes of a pc user or a computer user all this software is you know usable it's been developed by individuals or it's been developed by teams but then you have to consider that there's lots of other software that you may or may not have used as well in any case with the development of software you have to go through the same stages of what you would know as the traditional systems life cycle and it's certainly not an expectation that i go through the full systems life cycle as part of this unit but what you do need to understand is that all software is developed typically using phases two three and four and that's what we're going to concentrate on in this particular unit what we will be doing is specifically concentrating on the design of software and then you'll be using a new tool for that that's because that's because we're using something called UML or the unified markup language the build or the implementation phase that'll be done using an object-oriented programming language which in the case of this unit will be Java and testing will be done through a traditional testing methodology that you've all used before um, with other programming units there's nothing you know new with anything that you have done in that respect to give you an overview of the units each of the units is broken down into two lectures so effectively you'll be doing one unit per week in the majority of cases uh, the only exceptions to that rule will be for example if there is a test uh, a milestone test that's taking place uh, in the first six units um, you'll generally cover Java as a core programming practice so a lot of the things that you will see in this list now for example performing calculations making decisions 
uh, repeating or creating loops you've probably done in other programming courses so the first six of these units aren't going to cover a massive amount of object oriented programming the more or less a way that you can get used to the Java programming language and get used to the way that Java is used and laid out in comparison with other languages that you might have done uh, you'll find that there's a lot of similarities with some languages you find that there's a lot of differences with other languages in units 7 through 12 that's when we get into object oriented programming concepts in a lot more detail certainly uh, we're going to look at some higher level object oriented techniques which use a lot of new terminology that you've never used before we're also going to look at the application of Java possibly into some areas that you've not used before for example accessing external files and look at uh, sorting and searching techniques which have sort of uh, links to things like data structures and um, traditional searching sort and search methodologies um, so let's get on with it and the first thing we need to consider is that when we're developing software um, we have to turn a real world problem uh, into something very logical so we have a real world problem that we can be that can be very complex it can be very vague it can be very messy and we have to turn that into a workable computer program which has a very limited set of tools we need loops we need decision structures we need data structures the very limited the very specific and the very precise and you've already done this you've already performed this particular task of turning a real world problem that a lecturer might give you in a class and you've used computer software tools and techniques in order to turn that into a software based model that hopefully will solve a complex vague or messy problem this actual skill set that you've used to perform this is actually called abstraction we take a real world problem we turn it into a software based solution and that methodology uh, is called abstraction and the way that we perform it is that we take the main features of a real world situation and we apply tools and techniques in order to convert that real world situation into a working computer program some of those tools and techniques that you've used before lend themselves to more functional based programming languages you might have used pseudocode you might have used Nash Schneiderman charts and there are lots of different approaches that have been used in the past in this particular unit we're going to look at a very different methodology which is object oriented programming and the way object orientation works is obviously slightly different in that it's not a problem based approach it's an object based approach what I mean by that is that what you will actually do as part of this unit is you will develop a class or later on in the course a number of classes and those classes represent a real world model of an object we're going to look at that in a second but what we do is we generate a class which is a container for all the data and all the software models that allow that class or that module mod, model to be functional and what we do is we generate objects from that class this is almost if the class is a template and what we do is we make copies of that class in order to create instances of objects that will allow us to solve our problem let's look at this from an example point of view we have a class called car and it's used in a computer system for a second hand car showroom and what we can do is we can use a class to model the main characteristic characteristics of that class for the purposes of the business that we're building it for so as an example we can have a class called car and we can create instances of that class for each of the cars in that showroom. 
So we have to formally build a model of that particular class. And this is where we get into the design element of object-oriented programming. And we're going to use the formal notation for that now, which is called Unified Modeling Language, or UML. UML diagrams can get very large and very complex. So we're going to start with the most basic one first. And then as we get more and more into it, we're going to make more and more complex class diagrams. And this is a typical class diagram. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, you can generate these electronically. Um, you could even sort of use the drawing tools in Word or, you know, there are lots of other online tools like um, Lucidchart or you could use Microsoft Physio. But basically, they're just three rectangles stacked on top of each other. But you have to put the right information into the right boxes. A typical class diagram has uh, the name of the object in the top box. The middle box contains all of the information about that particular object. Uh, we call them instance variables. You might call them in, uh, just variables uh, in other languages. Uh, but you declare the variables in the middle box. And the bottom one is probably the most awkward one, which are these things called methods. Um, you've probably not come across methods before, um, but those are the things that, or the actions that that class can perform. So as an example, if we keep to the car sales example, we can sell a car, we can drive a car, we can put petrol in a car, we can fix it, we can drive it. And they're all actions that can be performed on that class. So we name those methods in the bottom box. So just as a quick exercise, have a go at this, pause the video and just think about the car class example that we've just talked about and come up with a list of the instance variables that you might use for that particular application and more in a more difficult situation think about the methods which you might use okay so pause the video for a minute have a go at it and then you can carry on okay is my possible solution now it doesn't necessarily mean that anything that i've got and you've not got makes it necessarily wrong um but just a couple of things that I've jotted down to give you an idea. Notice that a lot of these are directly related to the application. You don't need to put every conceivable piece of data into your UML diagram. You just have to put the data and the methods that are up, that up apply to the business case. So as an example, I haven't put a fix method in there because the assumption is is that a car wouldn't need fixing if you're selling it on a second hand car lot but you know as long as you've got something reasonably close to it you know it's a good start so in any situation where we're using object orientation you will get different OO designs from different people some people might do them in a very simple way some people might way overdo it and make them far far more complicated than they actually are it doesn't necessarily mean that yours is right and yours is wrong in a lot of cases but what you have to do is develop your skills in OO design because eventually what you're going to be doing is you're going to be given a problem to solve and the expectation is is that you will build UML diagrams which you can readily convert into Java code and that means that you have to formally design before you build and that's been a problem with a lot of students in the past so a real world system like we've talked about could have millions of lines of code hundreds of classes in general OO development in the large is developed uh, in teams where you will have multiple classes developed by lots of team members and then programming teams build their classes with their instance variables and their methods and then they join classes together 
in order to make much larger programs. Obviously, we're only working in a one semester module, so what we'll have to do is work on much smaller examples and build them up as the semester goes on. Later on, we're actually going to be looking at uh, programs with about four or five classes in it. Uh, but the language we're going to use is Java. And what we're going to do to start off with is have a look at where you get hold of the software, which in this case is BlueJay. We're going to look at a simple example and I'm going to run a quick demo and then we'll give you some work to do. Okay, the software we're going to be using for this semester is called BlueJay. And at one time, you had to get hold of the Java development kit and the BlueJay environment, and you had to install them both separately and get them to talk to each other. It was a bit of a pain, um, but you don't have to do that anymore. They've now made BlueJay and the Java development kit a single install file. Um, it's available from bluejay.org this is the website and you can download and install window what version for windows mac and you can get a version for linux as well um, i've already downloaded the windows version and this is the installer it's about 191 meg so it's not a massive file and uh, it's basically a case of just double click the installer uh, just say yes to everything and it just installs uh, as normally uh, as any other Windows application. Uh, what I'm going to be looking at is um, an example which is packaged with BlueJay called Shapes and it's available in this, well on the PC it's available in this particular folder so it's in the BlueJay folder in program files x86 in examples the shapes folder uh, is in there now it's not as straightforward as, as just opening it because when you install um, the examples as part of the installation all of the um, folders are read only so uh, for two reasons uh, the first one being I don't want the folder to be read only. The second one being I want to actually run uh, a copy of the provided folder structure um, so that if I make any changes, I can, you know, I've still got the original one. So what I, what I do is I take a copy of the folder and I'm, I've put a copy on the desktop for you and then I modify the properties so that um, I can take read only off. Uh, which makes it a lot easier to open uh, which is probably I mean for the sake of what we're doing with this uh, is probably a, a decent thing to do um, one thing to note about Java files in BlueJay the um, application files are all stored in a single folder so everything related to the example um, is all packaged in the same folder. So you have a series of Java files, you have a series of class files and you know we have readme files and things like that. The main reason for that is I've actually got this. I've already opened this before. Uh, your example for the first time might only have a few files in there. But one thing I will say is the whole project must be kept in the same folder don't for example just take the package file home on the expectation that everything's in the package file it won't be um, don't separate everything out that's in the project folder okay transport the whole folder not just the individual files it's actually quite useful in that in that respect because you only need to to basically carry the folder around uh, back it up on Google Drive, carry it home on USB stick, it doesn't really matter. But whatever you do, don't separate out these files, otherwise your project won't load. When you go to open in a project, uh, this is BlueJ open, uh, as, you know, it's, it's awaiting a project to be opened. If I open an existing project, 
off the desktop. I don't need to open a specific file, like a project file like you have in Visual Studio. You can just point to the folder which contains all of uh, the, 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 the project files and it will open it up and it will just open in the window for you. Uh, when you open it for the first time, you might find that there's some gray bars across these. Um, just be a case of just hit the compile button and it will just uh, compile those and those gray bars should go away. Uh, it's a really simple example, but it's a really good example to demonstrate how uh, basic Java uh, classes operate in BlueJay. Um, what we've actually got in this particular example are four different classes. One for canvas, circle, square and triangle. And what you've actually got is a really basic drawing program. And you start off by right clicking the canvas class and we open that up. And what it provides is a canvas on which we need to draw and it opens up this little method results which we can just close it's just an indicator that it's open and then what we can do is we can create instances of the circle square and triangle class and we can basically just create some simple drawings in the canvas so as an example if we right click and create a new instance of a circle what we have to do is give it a name so I'm going to leave it at circle one and straight away nothing's appeared in the ship's demo window. What we can do is we can examine the properties of this particular object instance circle one if we right click and go to inspect and if you have a look at the inspect window we can actually see the instance variables that are actually available to this particular instance and one of the first things you'll notice is we've got a diameter an xy position on the screen we've got a color but we've also got an is visible property which is a boolean we've done booleans in other programming languages but this boolean is set to false which basically means that it's not visible so what we have to do is change a property of that object the way that we do that is that we'll call a method which belongs to this object instance. So if we right click, there should be a method called make visible. If we select it, it makes our object visible and is visible is set to true. Other things that we can do now is we can call methods which have been written into that object instance. So for example, if I call move right, it moves right, move down, move up, and move left so that's got basic movement there are some methods where you are required to provide more data for example if I right click and I select change color it brings up a dialog box where it actually wants us to provide a string for a new color it gives us a list of available ones I'll just go for the simple one and change it from blue to red and it changes color you also see that the instance variable has changed as well we can add other circles so I'll add circle 2 and this is in the same situation when we inspect the object the string color is set to blue gives us dimensions and positions but it also tells us that its visible property is set to false. So what we have to do is call a method to make it visible. And we can also move that right a couple of times to show that we've now got two instances of a circle object, both of different colors. This is also the same for the square object, square one. If we inspect it, we can see it's got size, it's got position, it's got color, but it's also invisible. So we have to call the make visible method. 
so that we can see it. And again, we can call other methods to, for example, uh, let's have a move it right a couple of places and move it down a couple of places like that and the same goes for triangle we can create a new instance of a triangle called triangle one we can inspect it oops we can inspect it and we get a list of all the instance variables applicable to it it's invisible so we call make visible and we can see that we've got our triangle there and again we can call methods for example we can in this particular case change its size so we'll add two new pieces of data and we'll make it I don't know 10 by 10 for height and width and as you can see it's made it really really small um, once you've completed that obviously uh, there's a tutorial a tutorial that's going to be related to this as well and you're going to be playing with this for quite a, uh, quite a while and um, once you're finished we can actually close these windows down um, if you want to again if you're ready for finishing everything we can just close down the canvas class and we can close the project okay so after that demonstration uh, let's go back and have a look at uh, a couple of examples of UML diagrams for a couple of the classes that were in that demo program okay so what I've done is I've created two UML class diagrams one for circle and one for triangle and as you can see uh, they follow the UML rules they both have a class title they both have sets of instance variables and they both have some methods okay one thing you will notice is that if you invoke a method on any object instance the chances are it will have an effect on the instance variables as an example when we called the make visible method for one of the instances of the circle the is visible property changed from false to true with uh, for example the triangle position if we called the move right method it had an effect on the value of x position because it moved slightly to the right so the x position increased if we for example then called the move down method on the triangle then it would have a positive effect on the y position so the methods generally have an effect on the instance variables some of the methods that we used needed a little bit more information in order to make them work one of the examples that we looked at was change color and what we had to do is provide information to the method by filling in a little dialog box when I change the circle from blue to red I had to provide a piece of information for new color in the form of me typing the word red that's an example of what we call a parameter the chances are you've probably used parameters in other programming languages before and it's no different in the Java programming language uh, the tutorial will heavily involve the use of the shapes program in the example files that are provided with BlueJ. So get yourself acquainted with that before you come into the lesson. And just to summarize, uh, basically we've looked at the core concepts of object oriented development, where we utilize classes as templates for components classes contain instance variables which store information about them and they also have methods which allow us to perform actions on those objects we have parameters which in some cases allow us to add additional information for particular methods for example um, change color and we create 
instances of objects in BlueJ by right clicking them and giving them a unique name and eventually we will be creating programs with multiple objects which will all talk to each other and eventually we'll be writing our own Java development programs in the environment called BlueJay.